friend or two already in the Jeep, so she quickly her eyes. Sure. She puts on her workout clothes, places her shoes up, and drives to the courts, ready to have some fun. They do a 16-person round robin, so Bonnie's able to play with lots of different partners, um, and the competition is right where she likes it. The league is mostly made up of women, only two or three men are there. A few games in, Bonnie is feeling good about things. She's had some good rallies and powerful, powerful overhead shots and that go straight down the line, which is a good thing. Uh, the people are warm and friendly, and she's beginning to think she'd love to be a regular sub for this group. Game four is next on the round robin, pairing Bonnie with Emily against Brad and Lisa. First serve comes and goes, awesome dinking and some good hard fast shots back and forth. The score is neck and neck. It can go either way. Um, there's a point or two for Bonnie and Emily, followed right up with a point or two for Brad and Lisa. From the other end of the pickleball court, Bonnie observes Brad and Lisa walking back to the serving line, getting ready for their serve, side out. Lisa goes to serve and is interrupted by something her partner Brad says. She stops for a minute and they exchange words, but nothing that Bonnie can hear, probably discussing the score. The game continues with Brad and Lisa scoring a point. Brad walks over to Lisa's side, approaching her. He gets right in her personal space, almost touching faces, and then he touches her side right about the round of her hip. And then he leaves his hand there, um, intrusively. Lisa is dismissive and doesn't return the affectionate touch. All of Bonnie's senses are alerted. This is weird. Who is this Brad guy? And I can't unsee the interaction I just witnessed, she thinks to herself. The game plays on and Bonnie is feeling some major protective feelings for Lisa. She's younger than this guy and attractive. She's probably used to interactions with men like this, but still, it didn't make it right. The uneasiness doesn't leave. Bonnie must find out what this right guy is about and let someone know he could be a great guy. Story number two, Lisa. One day Lisa wakes up and hurries to get to her pickleball league on time. Lisa is thinking as they drive how glad she is that Brad was able to fit this league in midweek for the next few months and how fun it is to be able to play with him. They arrive at the courts and are introduced to a sub or two they haven't met and exchange hellos to all the regulars. Lisa forgot breakfast as usual and she plays the first few games thinking about food. Deciding she needs to focus on the competition, she resolves to push herself out of her comfort zone and play more aggressively. Game four is her and Brad against Emily and the new girl, Bonnie. Brad is always complaining that Lisa doesn't play as aggressively as she is capable of and gets frustrated sometimes about it. So Lisa is dead serious about this game. She is not going to lose it. Um, as they walk back to the serving line, Brad says something, but all Lisa hears is two, like the number two. What? Uh, no, she thinks I'm server one, not server two. She explains this to him, and he says, no, I think you're cute. Lisa's comfortable with Brad, but sometimes he catches her off guard. She is flustered. I mean, she's in game mode, no time for chit chat. She thinks he is nice and cute and all, but wants to get her head back in the game. No time for compliments. She says to score, that's what you do in pickleball, and proceeds to score the point. Brad walks over to Lisa and affectionately touches her hip. She ignores him because she doesn't want to draw attention, and he has been known to get more handsy if encouraged. She knows this. They've been married for 23 years. <laughs> they finish the game. It was worth Lisa's focus because they win. Story number three, Brad. Brad is trying to impress his wife, Lisa, and get better at pickleball. One of his favorite days is Wednesday because they get to play together. He meets Bonnie and likes her. He thinks they are friends. He plays with his wife, Lisa, which doesn't always happen depending on the rotation that week, so this is a good Wednesday. He hits the ball and notices his wife looks cute. He tells her. He gets in her face to smile at her and is affectionate and she brushes him off. Then later he found out, finds out that Bonnie thinks he's a predator. So I have Lisa in this story, and this is my husband's Brad. <laughs> His body is now a friend of ours. <laughs> so I'm here today to talk about appreciating each other's diversity and uniqueness, loving and accepting people for who they are. I am not an expert, um, but I keep telling myself that I can be the expert of my own experiences. So I'm going to share some of those with you today. Our reality is just that, ours. I invite you today to look outside your reality and what you think you know. I think what matters in our lives is our relationships with the people around us. I'm not talking about, like your city manager said, I'm not talking about letting people into your lives that cause harm, but accepting people different than you. I'm talking about loving people for who they are and not what you want them to be. So I think this happens in three parts. Number one is assumptions. Number two is curiosity. And number three is friendship. 
So number one is assumptions. I shared these three stories to illustrate the assumptions we make. All three stories came from one interaction, and this happens all the time. We make assumptions without any context, and context matters. This is where what I like to call graceful assumption comes in. We think what we think. It can't necessarily be helped or <coughs> controlled or prevented. Um, and our assumptions bring feelings with them. Sometimes it elicits very strong feelings, but what matters is what we do with our assumptions. So I invite you to give grace. Whatever Bonnie perceived elicited strong feelings. She she's still like we we it's it's the best joke now because you know Nate's going around hugging random people just to you know wind her up and stuff. But like she <laughs> is the best because she was very protective of me, and I appreciated that. Um, the interaction I described is how she described it to me later. Her feelings were real, even though she was wrong. And I think that is very interesting. I have learned that my gut reaction isn't always intuition. What has felt wrong or scary to me at times maybe wasn't actually wrong or scary. Maybe it was my assumptions, beliefs, or even prejudices about those things. We can be graceful like Bonnie. She made assumptions based on what she saw and interpreted it to mean, but she gave grace. She questioned how she felt and why before she came judge and jury. Bonnie asked someone she knew was a friend of mine, and she got to speak. She could have yelled at Nate, or called him names, or told him he was a creep. Instead, she went to a trusted source and got more information. So, assumptions. We may not know what we think we know. So as I was, as I was putting this together, um, I kind of, I'm kind of like a visual person, or I need like a, I don't know, like a handout. Like, a, I don't know, something to remember, because I, I just, I hear a lot of information, and I feel things, and but then I forget. So I kind of was thinking that I, with each thing I talk about, I'm going to give you a couple of ideas of how to apply it. And these are not like, you know, mind-blowing, like, I, it's, they're not even all, they're not all my ideas. They're just things that have helped me. So they may not surprise you. Maybe you already do them, but I'm just going to go over ideas to apply. So be willing to be wrong. That's it. Just like be willing to be wrong. You could be wrong. Like next time, you know, someone hurts your feelings, uh, tell yourself a different meaning. I am really good at this. I can make in my mind anything be a good thing if I want it to be, which I think is a talent and I think it's a good thing. I don't know if it's healthy, <laughs> I don't know. but it works for me. I, I just tell yourself a different meaning. Um, like in the simplest of ways, if someone cuts you off on the freeway, you know, Maybe it's a sad guy. Maybe, he, maybe he's in a hurry. Maybe he's hurting. Maybe he's not a sad guy. Maybe he's a you know old woman who's oblivious. Maybe it's a dog driving the car. Like it just doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> tell yourself whatever you tell yourself to make it better in your mind. Um, and then my favorite is use the the I call it the three keys to unsuccess to catch yourself. Let me explain. So I'm married to a man that is my opposite in a lot of ways. He assumes he's not going to like a person, and then is surprised when he does. I assume everyone will be my friend, and I'm surprised when people are me. I've learned to appreciate both perspectives. Our individual life experiences have made us arrive at our assumptions, but that's true of every human, so sometimes we have to challenge it. Nate has strong opinions, a big personality, and is highly intelligent. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't like to talk, so this will be fun. <laughs> um, is he a tad pessimistic? Yes. Could he be more optimistic? Probably. But he's the best kind of human because he challenges his ideas and thoughts and is introspective in a way that is impressive. So this sounds, I don't know, maybe a little pessimistic, but I wanted to share something because I bet there are some fellow pessimists out there that this could be helpful to. Um, Nate has a tendency to react first, apologize second. So he came up with the formula for success. I'm being sarcastic. It's, it's actually the, key, the three keys to one success. You'll get what I mean. Um, when, so he made up his formula to catch himself making wrong assumptions and, and jumping to conclusions. So there's three parts. Number one is freak out. Just completely freak out. <laughs> Blow it up in your mind, dramatize it, go to your home, like freak out about it. Number two, assume the worst. You're all knowing, smarter than everyone, and things suck. Just assume the worst. And number three is send a passive aggressive text or email. This one's fun because who doesn't want like, you know, physical documentation of your outbursts, you know? Later you can be embarrassed by it. It's super cool. Um, obviously he's kidding, but he, this is his go-to list. 
and it's helpful to catch himself and maybe reevaluate. If he starts to do any of the three, he stops himself. He makes him laugh, and he realizes he may need to go about it a different way. He becomes aware. Um, and so now most of the time he stops before he sends the email or text. So that is progress. <laughs> so we've talked about assumptions. Now I'd like to focus on curiosity. Curiosity is the gateway to empathy. So Daniel Cox, he's the director and founder of the Survey Center on American Life. He goes on to say this. As a nation, we need to embrace curiosity and cultivate, cultivate the desire to learn from each other. There's no simple remedy for this. Human beings are experts at self-sorting. Many of the choices we make, conscious or not, are designed to insulate ourselves from people who do not share our values, backgrounds, or beliefs. Social media algorithms designed to filter out differing opinions have only alienated us further. How can we hope to learn anything about people who are different from us when we only interact with people who are similar to ourselves? Well, one way is to ask them, end quote. Yes, ask and I would add them listen. It is not really helpful to take something about someone that you don't understand and think about how you'll never understand it and think about how different you are from that person, even if that's true. To show compassion to have unity, if that is your goal, think about what you have in common with that person and then let them be themselves. You can relate with them and learn from them because they are like you and not like you, if that makes sense. Brene Brown said, in order to empathize with someone's experience, you must be willing to believe them as they see it and not how you imagine their experience to be. And this is called Little Houses. I lived in a cute little house, nice furnishings, good homes. I liked the floor plan, happy windows, fresh laundry, comfy beds, and a stocked fridge. The good treats hidden in spots only I know. And a cute doormat. All I could ever need, I lived in there. Sometimes I looked out the windows, but mostly I just looked inside, kept the view on me. It wasn't a cute little house by chance. I mean, I was busy washing things, folding things, baking things, teaching things. There's a lot to do. It's comfortable here, safe. I know this place. Every room, closet, staircase, and quiet space, I know the warm spots. I know um, where the most light comes in. I stayed in mostly doing my thing. Sometimes my eye would catch something going on outside, but I was too busy with my little to really think much, or to really look much at it. What did it have to do with me? I mean, there's only so much room here. We're at capacity. Um, it already felt full to bursting. A little blue flower forced me to look outside. I didn't plant that flower. I wasn't expecting it to grow here. It made me so curious. That little bugger. <laughs> One day, I opened my front door, threw open the curtains, took all the screens off my windows. Some of the windows stuck, but I muscled through. Um, light flooded in. I let the fresh air into me. There's a lot to see, there's a lot to feel, and what does it have to do with me? Everything. Because if I'm only looking in my house, I'm only seeing me. My flooring, my dishes, my laundry. I know these walls, they don't have to talk, I know what they say. I'm the expert here. Outside, not so much. Not at all, in fact. But as soon as I step, step off my porch and run down the street, I see all kinds of beautiful things. Fields and fields of every color of flower. They're different than me. Seeing them makes me whole. I didn't know what I was missing. I'm only as good as, that, as how much I'm willing to look beyond my own little house. Little houses have doors and windows for a reason. Yes, they're for shutting, protecting, but opening too. They're meant for others to enter and for us to get out. Look around, let the outside in. I'm still busy with my own house, but it got bigger. Lots more room, the door is unlocked and the windows are open. And I don't think my view is everything. The matter with human beings, the BFG went on, is that they is absolutely refusing to believe in anything unless they is actually seeing it right in front of their own schnozzles. You have to open the front door to see. This little house has grown bigger. Blooms of all kinds are popping up. Behind cupboards, lying on couches, under tables, and coming out of faucets underfoot on top of beneath and beside. You can plant yourself here. Nourish each other. I'll show you where the best light comes in, the warm spots and all the good food. Our own houses, looking beyond our own houses, doesn't make our houses crowded. They don't burst or break. They stretch, they accommodate, making room for growth. Door is always open now here at this big little stretchy house. So curiosity. Everyone has a story, a reason for the way they act and believe. 
and it's hard to hate someone close up. Ask questions and listen to people's stories. I don't know if you noticed, but in my little house's poem, I referenced a little blue flower that started growing in my house. Um, I'm speaking metaphorically here, it wasn't a real flower, but remember that flower, because um, it made me curious. And being cu curious connects us in the most beautiful way. People are usually surprisingly open to sharing if they feel safe and not judged. I also think people overshare a little when they're caught off guard, and I have found that to be a good thing. Um, you get to see why people do what they do and why they think how they think. And for the most part, people want to relate, but don't take the time, because curiosity takes effort. It takes effort for the sharer, and it's effort for the listener. Um, and I think we need to be willing to do both. This is called My Favorite Color Is You. I went down to his room. I didn't see it at first. It was so small. But when I looked closer, yes, it, it was a tiny little perfect flower. It had sprouted up right out of the carpet in the middle of the room, like it had always been there. It hadn't. Well, it had, but I just kept walking by it. It was small, and I was so much bigger than it. It had delicate but intricate tiny white petals, each one carefully made, so beautiful. As I looked closer, I thought my eyes deceived me. The little plant that held those petals was blue. <laughs> Plants aren't blue. I mean, not all. Some are blue, but most are green. This made me more confident. I got right down and looked at it close up. Blue. Every plant I know is green, like 94.4%. Are there blue plants? I guess I do know some that are. I grabbed some scissors and started cutting back the carpet from around it. I needed to see if the dirt underneath was blue. Brown. The dirt was brown. There was moisture at its roots. I dabbed the dirt at its base with a tissue to see if the dampness was blue. Nope. Clear. What? Not even a trace of where the blue could have gotten it. I looked at the adorable little plant again. Still blue. I went upstairs. I'll look at it again tomorrow, I told myself. I gave it a few days just to be safe. I saw the perfect little petals and thought, silly me, this plant can't be blue. I mean, it's blue, but I was planning on it being green. This went on for a while, longer than I'd like to admit. Maybe when I go down there now, it'll appear the way I thought it would more greenish. But the flower just looked at me, being itself. I love that flower. But I worry about its blueness. Sorry, I'm not sad, it's just, it's so tender. Um, will all the green plants be mean to it? Will it wish it were different? Will it be happy? Will it make other flowers around it blue? Where did the blue come from? Will it realize how uniquely beautiful it is? I looked up for some reason at the ceiling. Sometimes if I look up, I think I'll see inspiration. Just then, a little sunburst came through that ceiling, landing right on the flower. It took the sunlight in, sighing it stood a little taller. In a moment, I knew that the sun had that tiny flower in its care. All is as it should be. I water it now. I try to keep all the weeds down. I tell it exactly what I think of it. It's perfectly blue. It's made my life more beautiful. I'm sorry if I made it hard to be blue. I didn't mean to. It's bigger and stronger. It's grown so much. It's blue. Nothing and no one made it blue except the sun, and he knows what's best. I'm so grateful it's blue. Now I delight in its blueness. I wouldn't have it any other way. If that little blue plant hadn't popped right up in my house, I'm afraid I would have never known how incredible it is that they exist. And then I get one. Every time I see it, I hope it's bluer. It's funny. Blue has always been my favorite color. I don't love it. Even though it's blue, I love it because it's blue. And not just me, the sun does too. We should all learn more from, about blue plants. Listen to them when they sprout up. Because they grow here in these parts to teach us. They are patient and kind and perfect. Because they are blue. Now we dream in shades of blue. The grass may be greener on the other side, but I'll stay on this side. It's where I'm meant to be, in the blue. So, um, a couple ideas to apply. Oh, I hope I don't have any for um, so I guess to apply for being curious. If something in your life starts growing at your house or around you, get curious. Learn everything you can about it. Read things, watch things, ask things about it, but, question, but ask questions without an, having an answer in mind. Just listen. 
Um, and this other idea is just literally like the, I don't know if you guys have heard of Humans of New York. It's a, it's like it's an account on like Facebook and Instagram, but like they just interview people in New York and they tell their stories and it is incredible the stories people have and the stories they share. Some are you know it's colorful, some are rated, but like they are so impactful. Like and has, have helped me to just be curious about people and learn where they come from and why they do things and it's so inspiring. So I would recommend checking out Humans of New York. Um, Lastly, friendship. We do not exist alone. We need each other. Um, I recently learned about trees, and it has solidified my love for them and made me understand why I love them. A friend of mine shared a book with me called The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wolven. He's a forester that has studied trees, how they live and communicate and take care of one another. They share nutrients with struggling trees through their roots and even warn each other of impending danger. It says, the most astonishing thing about trees is how social they are. The trees in a forest care for each other, sometimes even going as far as to nourish the stump of a felled tree for centuries after it was cut down. Um, by feeding it sugars and other nutrients, so keeping it alive. Only some stumps are thus nourished. Perhaps they are the parents of the trees that make up the forest of today. A tree's most important means of staying connected to other trees is a wood white web of soil fungi that connects vegetation in an intimate network that allows the sharing of an enormous amount of information and goods. The reason trees share food and communicate is that they need each other. It takes the forest to create a microclimate suitable for the tree growth and sustenance. So it's not surprising that isolated trees have far shorter lives than those living connected together in forests. Most individual trees of the same species grow in the same stand growing in the same stand are connected to each other through their root systems. It appears that nutrient exchange and helping neighbors in times of life, um, in times of need is the rule. But why are trees such social beings? Why do they share food with their own species and sometimes even go as far as to nourish their competitors? The reasons are the same as for human communities. There are advantages to working together. A tree is not a forest on its own. A tree cannot establish a consistent local climate. There's also the place. Um, it is at the mercy of wind and weather, but together many trees create an ecosystem that moderates extremes of heat and cold, stores a great deal of water, and generates a great deal of humidity. And in this protected environment, trees can live to be very old. To get to this point, a community must remain intact no matter what. If every tree were looking out only for itself, then quite a few of them would never reach old age. Regular fatalities would result in many large gaps in the tree canopy, which would make it easier for storms to get inside the forest and uproot more trees. The heat of summer would reach the forest floor and dry it out. Every tree would suffer. We need each other. And like the beautiful example of trees, we are only as good and as happy as our fellow man. Helping others makes us in return happy and healthy too. Sharing our nutrients and experiences and being a friend makes us all stronger. Callie from Isabel Family Films said, it is cathartic to share, but it is also terrifying. I am learning though that your community can only grow through vulnerability. The tragedy of motherhood, and I would add any relationship with humans, is we don't share the hard stuff with each other. We live feeling like everyone else is doing it better than us. Keeping to ourselves and not engaging in communities and friendships weakens us and doesn't do anyone any good. So reach out and be a friend. So a couple ideas to apply. Make new friends wherever you go. Engage with people in day-to-day -day life. Um, I just recently volunteered with this nonprofit organization. I'm scared to death. I don't know anybody there. I have no, I don't know. And I love people, but I like my circle of friends. So for me, that's really scary. But I'm excited to get in an environment where I'm not completely comfortable and make new friends. Um, also, when, when met with conflict because of someone, be willing to see things from their perspective and avoid believing statements like, if this person believes this way or is a member of this organization or is a member of this religion or votes for this guy, um, resist the urge to believe that you can never be friends with those type of people because it's not true. And it puts people in boxes and causes division. Friends who think, act, and love differently than you do is a good thing for us, our families, and communities. 
So I put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to get a little bit vulnerable again. I've had the privilege of learning firsthand how to be a graceful assumer, being curious, and engaging with people different than me, and being a friend. Um, you probably guess who my, blue, my little blue flower is. And I don't know what your blue flower is, but this is mine. It didn't come from Amazon. You can't get it at the mall. It doesn't fit in a box or gift bag. There are no ribbons or bows or tissue paper. It didn't even come with a card. There was no cash tape in the inside, no confetti or gift tag. The best present I ever got came in the form of a little boy. This gift grew from inside me and grew in spite of me. I didn't know how to do it but guided me, taught me, showed me, inspired me, and changed me. I was born when he was born. I saw his little face and saw the face of God. This is how my parents must love me. This is how my heavenly parents must love me. It was on his tiny newborn face. It was such a gift. His face got older, less boyish. The day came he told me bravely. He looked down at his hands and said, I like boys. That same face. Now wore a strong jaw and tears. His whole body cried. My heart broke wide open. That was the second gift. My heart broke and wide open because now bigger ideas, more information, lots of understanding and empathy unlocked it. A gate opened wide, agape, God's pure love, flowed in and through my wide open heart. He taught me how to listen to things I had never heard. Um, I could hear with my ears, but not my heart, until this gift came, wrapped in a boy who was becoming a man right before my eyes. Make my heart fat and my ears heavy. I want to love big and listen to heart, until I've done so much listening, my ears came down low, heavy. My boy forced me to listen and taught me how to love and changed me. My heart had to be blown wide open, reconstructed. My heart now has ears. I was born with a little heart in need of busting. My son's came big. He was born this way with a big heart and gay. That rhymes, I didn't even think of rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's the best gift I've ever gotten. It's wrapped in acceptance. It's tied with empathy, tissue papered with faith, tied with understanding and gifted with unconditional love. The stuff that weighs heavy on your heart is actually a gift because the heavy heart breaks and it leaves it open to learn and grow and change, changing you. It's uncomfortable until it's not, and then it's just the best gift ever. Um, so that's winding down to the end of my talk. I'm just grateful to be here and to bought up to ugly cry in front of everyone that I'm not that grateful for, but like. I'm grateful for the opportunity, and I'm so grateful for my life experiences, and um, as the mom of a boy who is different in a way than most, I just, I would just implore you to be kind, just be kind, question your assumptions, be curious, and listen. You don't have to understand to love, but be willing to reach out in your current bubble. It may not be comfortable. Discomfort is the price of admission to a meaningful life. I have found such incredible joy in my discomfort. It is where we are at our best. I believe in us. People are good and rise up when given the opportunity. Um, for me, it's been a walk with God. I believe in God. I'm a spiritual person, but I know and respect that that is not everybody's path. Um, but God walked with me and helped me walk off an old me, and I'm so grateful. Um, so thanks for listening.